What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Mehran Podcast. For this episode, I got the chance to talk with Sam Zayner. The podcast is now on Patreon, which provides a great way for the listeners to help support the podcast. With your support as patrons, you'll be entered in exclusive monthly raffles this season, as well as getting shoutouts in the podcast, seeing behind the scenes, and even getting the chance to have a question asked to guests. Your support helps out a ton, so check it out at patreon.com slash the Mehran Podcast. So with that said, big shout out to Will Cameron, first patron on Patreon. Thanks for your support, bro. Sam is a pro skier from the East Coast who now lives in Colorado. In the past years, he's made a name for himself with his top tier rail skills and with the segment he's been putting out year after year. And with his most recent segment in Most Gutter, we can definitely say he's one of the best street skier of his generation. It was super good to have Sam on the podcast. We talked about his youth on the East Coast, head injuries, his new movie Most Gutter, and much, much more. A big thank you to this episode's sponsors, Axis Board Shop, Planks Clothing, and especially a big thank you to Jay Skis for presenting this episode. I'm really thankful to have them supporting the podcast once again. I love their skis and I love their brand. They're a small business based out of Burlington, Vermont. They make their skis in Quebec and they're full of passionate people who love skiing. They make award-winning skis of all kinds, whether you're looking for a powder ski, a ski to go touring, a park ski, or an all-mountain ski. They've got it all. I've had Jason Leventhal on the podcast last year, and talking with him, you could see how passionate he is and the energy he puts into his company. This year, I'll be skiing on the J All Place Street Rat Ski. I'm stoked to try them out soon. Check them out at jskis.com. Support companies that support skiing. Support J Skis. Let's go! Mr. Sam Zanner, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I'm stoked to have you. What's good these days in the Colorado life? Uh, just living in Denver, started my own painting business. I'd been painting for years and figured I'd do it on my own with uh, Pete Kukov. We do it together and just started that up in like May. So I've been doing that all summer, but ready to get going skiing. What was the thinking behind starting your own business? I'm guessing not having the Red Bull dollars kind of pushes you there. What made you like start your own business versus um, just, you know, getting a, a job somewhere? Uh, I don't know. I didn't really know what I just finished college a year ago and I did business marketing and I don't know. I just didn't really know what I wanted to do necessarily. There wasn't anything I was like passionate about trying to go to or like a career path. Um, mm -hmm. And I just I painted since I was like 19. And I'm like, hey, might as well just try to do this, do it on my own, you know, make a lot more money than doing it for someone else. How hard was it? Was it easy going off getting contracts? Because I'm guessing you get more money doing your own business, but then there's that whole pressure of actually getting the contracts. Yeah, I mean, it was good. Uh, so Pete is from Boulder. So his mom kind of sent like a neighborhood email, which kind of got us started. And we got our first job and then it kind of just spider web from there. And now we have like a contractor we work with and other stuff. So we've been able to stay busy, which is dope. Really wasn't too bad. Wasn't as hard as you'd think going into it. To That's dope. So does it change your, um, your financial situations versus the other seasons? Like, are you more comfortable going in? Yeah. I mean, I've, for the past couple, it's been comfortable. We've been able to get a decent little budget and stuff where I've, you know, was able to not be stressing and actually like not even work through the winter and just focus on skiing and making the movie and doing all that work. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously it's better, you know. You're dropping your third movie under Strictly? Is it the third one? So this year would be the third one, but yeah, but, but we split up and made three different movies. So yeah, but this would be the third year as like officially as Strictly. It was like the first year I made Banged Up that we, that we had gibberish mm -hmm. put out. And then Andrew made Strictly Business and we premiered them together at the Fox, which is the same venue we just went back to this year. So yeah, there was, there was that one year where it wasn't actually Strictly. And then it was after that, we're like, all right, let's all like get together and do it for real. And then we made Welcome, which is the first one under Strictly. And then Bermuda and this year, Most Gutter. Yeah. And Most Gutter and Wild Card and then Gavin's movie, uh, August Light. You've been known and loved in the the ski community for a lot of years now, and you're known for your rail technicality and your just rail skills in general. I want you to tell me, like, where does that come from? Because I remember I first saw you at a ski to east shoot back in 2013. 
there were a lot of people there. And I remember you and Keegan Kilbride standing out. Like Keegan already had his style doing different tricks than everyone else with like co grab combos. And you on the other side were just doing like super tech rail things, but like at a young age. So you grew up on the East Coast riding Shady Mountain and got to be like one of the best rail skiers in the world right now. I mean, I think that, you know, that like sets you up for it almost for skiing rails. It's like they didn't have good jumps. And like, sure, I can do some jump tricks and stuff, but it's like they didn't, they didn't have good jumps. And it was just like, I'd take, I'd ski night laps. It was icy. It's like, I'm not going to be, go, you know, flying <laughs> off jumps, doing tricks and stuff over just ice. So I don't know, just, just ski rails. I just, and I go every day. I'd ski like every day almost from, I don't know, like five o'clock to like nine or whatever it, it was when they closed nine or 10 just after school. As someone from the ice coast also, I remember riding the park when it was icy and I wouldn't want to hit rails. Like if you try something, you slip up and you fall on an ice patch, it's not really inviting. No, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. It's just what it was. So I was just used to, you know, just made it work. I was just used to it. But obviously, yeah, the ice, the ice is terrible. My, my good friend, Chris, who like taught me how to ski back in the day, he, he landed on his back on ice doing a backflip on his back and shattered his sternum it's like i don't know how he landed on his back and it must have like pushed his ribs together damn and shattered his sternum like i don't know the ice was gnarly i don't know it's just it's too nice you know you almost get it easy out here skiing in colorado what were your your inspirations or your because you basically grew up in the early 2010s like yes yeah, so i grew up in st louis rollerblading and then and then it, what happened was i moved to new jersey in 2007 and then i think it was in like 2008 i was in eighth grade i was like 12 or 13 or something and pretty much in the winter i couldn't skate and my mom was like my so my best friend chris was a ski racer and he lived down the street and my mom was like you have to go skiing with chris i don't want you just sitting around because you're not skating whatever it's you know there's snow around and she's like go skiing i didn't even really want to and i like went skiing and chris literally taught me how to ski on his like little sister's race skis And that's kind of how it all started. Started with 50-50 on boxes with uh, race skis. Yeah, like I remember doing like fives off of like a two-foot little lip, like pretty much like a lip onto a rail, like doing like 540s off. Because I would do all that stuff on rollerblades, you know, I would do like flips and spins and all that on rollerblades. So it kind of, it translated a bit. Mm. Like I, I was like doing flips on skis probably before I actually like knew how to ski good. That's crazy. You know? I'd like pizza down the hill, but still do like a Misty 7, you know? <laughs> Damn. Do you know that was basically like Kaya Tursky's thing? Yeah, she was a rollerblader. Yeah, she was like super good on rollerblades. And it's basically Destructure who said like, hey, I think you should put on a pair of skis. You, you'd be good. And like she basically got on super quick. Yeah, it, it translates pretty well. Not as well though as like I've seen like hockey players. I have a friend who was a hockey player and then he started skiing. Mm. and was so good so quick because they get the edge control yeah the whole the whole edge thing and the skis being long like definitely was like challenging how did you get into park skiing when you were a kid was it just like the the drive as a rollerblader to try and do crazy stuff or were you like watching movies because you rode the same hill as sean jordan you told me and some other guys that made it big was there like a pro skier or movie inspiration for you or, or it was just like the love of doing tricks and those kind of stuff Yeah, I think at first it was mostly like it was mostly just that I wanted to do tricks and I wanted, you know, to do flips and spins and stuff because that's what I knew on rollerblades. But um, I mean, obviously, like watching films came into play. I think the first ski movie, like the first ski movies I saw was like Refresh and Every Day is a Saturday. Those were like the first two that I saw that definitely played a part. And I never maybe realized it because it took so long till I actually like started skiing street and stuff. But it was like even even watching those movies, I would like watch the movies and like skip all the POW segments. I'd never even watch them. <laughs> I'd just watch the street segments. So like there, there was a calling there. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. And those are such good movies to get you started. Yeah. Such a good like time in skiing right there. Because people always talk about like all the old stuff. I'm like, honestly, I have no idea. I've never really. Well, to me, those movies are like as good as it gets. Like you can go into refresh and look back to almost any of the street segments and they still hold up. Oh, so good. Even like what's, I forget which movie it's in, but like Ahmet's 
one segment with uh, yeah, I trip segment. Yeah, with the chip the rip song. Yeah, yeah, it's still so good. You skied a lot of park, got really good, and basically with the whole rollerblading, and I think you have some uh, some some crazy in you because if you were flipping on rollerblades at twelve, I think you have that that crazy factor. Yeah. I used to I used to just go into quarter pipes and just do switch front flips like in quarter pipes on rollerblades is like my thing. Dude, that's gnarly. With a helmet or no? Yeah, I wore I most of the time, most of my time in high school too skiing, I I wore a helmet and then and I hit my head like a lot in high school. And then I stopped wearing a helmet and like didn't hit my head at all for like five years, six years. Not like a single time with no helmet doing all this shit. And then recently, it just the street skiing is a whole different thing. Fuck. And it's just, you know, you're skiing like, you got like an inch of snow on pavement and every everything's just sketchy. So that kind of changed all that. And now it's time for a first sponsor break. Access Board Shop is a sponsor of the podcast once again, and I'm stoked to have them. They support dope athletes, they sponsor video projects, and they put together the best events. They've been in business for close to 20 years and they're still passionate about everything skiing and snowboarding. Whatever you may need this season, they've got it. Skis, boots, bindings, clothing, outerwear, you name it. So if you're in Quebec, go check out their shop in Saint-Sauveur. If not, check them out online at accessboutique.com. Support companies that support skiing. Support Axis Board Shop. I've rewatched all your segments for the episode and there's a, a couple bales in there that, ah, uh, they're, they're hard to look at. Yeah, my worst one was in it's it's in Welcome, which was my worst head hit probably of them all. Like, because I've got I've knocked myself out now once a year for the past three years, like out cold. And uh, the worst one, it's really quick in there, but my worst one was probably in Welcome. It was that rail that like it was in Duluth. It's that rail that like Noah Albandeo has hit where he went. He slid. It's a red one. It's like a flat rail transfer to a down. And he goes to switch to it. And I was trying to three swap it. I was like super close. Like if the rail was probably like a foot longer, I probably would have landed and done it. But the down rail is a little bit short. So I was like barely nicking that. And that one, I hit the back of my head and just did the, they call it fencing where you hit your head and you get knocked out and you mm -hmm. stick your arms straight in there. And that one was bad. That one like got me for like a few days after I felt like fucked up for a few days, which which is long for me. Usually I bounce back pretty quick, but that one was bad. Yeah, the the whiplash on that shot seems... Yeah. Ah. Well, that's what got me off for too. It was like Alex Havey filmed it, and um, he films a lot of skateboarding, and he had had a, a buddy who was a skateboarder who hit his head, and I think it was like two days later, he like started to not feel so good, so he went into the doctor, and they were like, good thing you came in. Like, your brain's been bleeding this whole time, and like... If you wouldn't have come in, like you would have just like died, like something like that. And then, and then he's the one who made me. He was like, "Go get a CAT scan." And then ever since then, I'm just like, "Fuck!" Every time I hit my head, I go get a CAT scan. You know, because I'm like, I'm not gonna risk it. Because who knows? Even if I feel fine, because usually I feel pretty fine. It's like your brain can be bleeding, and you just don't know it. Yeah, I don't know how much you want to get into that, but does the accumulation of head injury worry you at all? Yeah, I mean, it definitely worries me. But then I always think like. Because who knows, you know what I mean? It's such a like, you know, it's not like a set in stone thing how that all works. It's like, you know, it can affect people all differently. Yeah. And at least with me, like I'll hit, the thing is now it's like I hit my head and it just knocked, I just get knocked out so easily now, which I don't know if that has to do with like the accumulated head injuries. Like I probably have like, I don't know, like 12, 13 concussions and probably like, If I were to say probably like five or six of them are like significant. Like I had a couple in high school where I forgot like a whole day or two. Damn. And now recently where they all just like knock me out. But I, all of them, I remember up to, I remember up to like a millisecond before it happened. Like in my head, I remember like about the fall, I'm like, oh shit in my head. <laughs> and I, I remember it. And then I kind of come to like 10, 15 minutes later. I'm just like sitting in the van with my ski boots off and everything. And I'm just like, God damn it. Not again. And, but I'll feel fine. I'll have maybe headaches or light will affect me for like maybe a day. Mm. And then I'm like, fine. Like I went in that one that was, uh, when I was filming X games, that was pretty bad. I went into the doctor 
And they weren't even going to give me a scan or anything. Like, honestly, you're fine. They checked me out. They like, seemed perfectly fine. And then I showed him the video. I'm like, dude, look at the video. And he's like, and he's like, oh, shit. Like, all right, let's do a scan. So I don't know. Like, I don't know. Something with my body. I'm, I always, like, come back pretty quick, which I don't know if that means mm -hmm. anything for, like, long term. It's weird. You see that with football players where, you know, there's some that they all get a lot of concussions in their career and some end up really bad and others it seems that they're good yeah um same thing with skiing i guess where there's a lot of times where even the lightest hit on your head is still kind of not good well they say it's the repetitive ones yeah that are worse and that's like kind of was my thing in high school i remember like ski and park like i'd hit my head and like not like be a it'd be like a i could tell it was like a slight concussion you know, i'd see a little stars and stuff but get up and be like feel pretty fine and be okay not forget anything you know mm-hmm And like there was, I do that like kind of frequently <laughs> that would happen, you know, but it hasn't, it hasn't seemed to affect me too much. And I, I used to get all worried about it. I'm like, shit, I'm going to get like CTE, like Dave Mira mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And I don't know, like if you're like in MMA or football, it's like they get so many more. It's like this, the amount I have is nothing compared to all that. So it doesn't worry me as much as it used to. Always got to always wear a helmet now. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Gl that's what I was about to say. I'm glad I saw you wearing your helmet in most gutter. I've been good lately because I've realized I used to not care. I'd hit my head and I was younger and I like didn't give a shit. Mm -hmm. And now I've you know, if the the turning point was like when I hit my head um, filming for X Games that one bad crash. So I. I was already invited late. I hit my head and Gavin was like, I'm not going to film you for two weeks. So I took two weeks off in the middle of it. Come back. I got two shots in Denver. And then I went back to like meet up with everyone else, the crew who was like in Montana. And then the first spot I tried to hit, which actually was, it was Calvin's Ender in Bermuda. It's a, it was a flat rail, 90 degree transfer to a DFD with like a fence right at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And I was hitting it at first and I fell, I fell. And like, I don't even think I hit my head. Like I scrubbed through the clip so many times and I don't actually think my head even hit the ground, but just the whiplash that happened concussed me. And I like got all disoriented and forgot stuff. Damn. And that's when it freaked me out. because I was like, I felt fine for two weeks. And then this happens where I don't even, uh, I don't even hit my head and you know, it can cuss me. And I'm like, that's what really started to freak me out. And then also later that year, I saw Carson Kerr. He got knocked out and I saw it actually, because I never see it. You know what I mean? All my homies had to like deal with like watching that shit happen. And I saw it and he was all like fucked up and hit his head and like knocked out and half asleep. And it like, I saw it firsthand and like that freaked me out too. I was like that. Yeah. It's always something different from the outside. Like uh, how much does the head injury work into your trick selection nowadays because like in most gutter you went hard we will get to talk about it but there's a lot of crazy trick and shot and spot selection in there like how much does the um, maturity or like wisdom gets in saying like hey is it sketchy for the head yeah it did it did toward the end so this year i was literally hitting a spot and i i like bailed the side but i like launched like 15 feet up in the air and I didn't, I wasn't even worried in the air. I remember being in the air and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna get toe bang when I land. And then instead when I landed, I landed on grass, just double ejected, hit my forehead in the ground, just out cold sleeping. I literally, I literally dented, I had a Smith maze, dented the whole forehead in and I blew the MIPS out. You know, the MIPS has the little yellow like thing that slides. I've like ripped it out of the inside of the helmet and I'm just on the ground snoring just to sleep. Calvin had to run over and like wake me up. He's like, you literally, I was just snoring on the ground. And after that, I was Honestly, I was about to just not even hit another spot. I was like, fuck this. I'm done like for good because this shit's not worth it. Is that shot in the movie? No, nah, it's not in the movie. It looks really fucking stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it, looks really, it looks really dumb. It's just me flailing around in the air. And then when I actually hit my head, I'm hiding behind like the spot. So all you do is you hear a thud and then see me just slide out like three feet just on my face to sleep. Just like <laughs> just slide on the ground. It, it it looks really dumb, so I didn't put it in. And now it's time for another sponsor break. I'm stoked to have Planks Clothing as a sponsor again this year. I love the brand. 
Everything they make is top quality and super stylish. Planks has just launched their new No Skiing on Mars capsule collection. The No Skiing on Mars collection is a collaboration between Protect Our Winters UK, also known as PAL, and Planks Clothing. With the sales of this limited collection made from recycled fabrics, they aim to raise over 5,000 euros. This donation will help fund PAL's carbon literacy program, which is already changing individual and businesses' carbon conception for the better. Mars may be the next frontier for human settlement, but it sucks as a ski destination. Our Earth is amazing and we must help protect it. No skiing on Mars is available to shop now at planksclothing.com. Support companies that support skiing. Support Planks Clothing. Those are kind of the worst. It seems like I remember Dom back in the Dom Laporte, back in the Tabernak pack days. He had a shot like that where he jumped onto a sculpture, did a stall, and then jumped back into the tranny. But he double ejected while landing and just fell on his face. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, he broke his jaw. Yeah. And I think that's a point where he was like, like you said, like that shit is not worth that. Like there's some injuries that. You tell me because you've done it a lot, but it seems like there are injuries that you deal through it and like like a broken wrist. You get a cast and you move on. And there's other ones where you're just like, dude, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah, I literally, I'm at the point where like, dude, I'd rather like break both of my fucking legs than hit my head again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely though last year after that like changed my whole, per honestly, I didn't even think I was going to be making another movie this year, but I guess we are. But uh, <laughs> I didn't even think I was like, dude, I'm fucking done. Like, I need to stop. But it definitely played a pretty big factor in the spots I hit after the head injury, which I still hit a couple big ones. But, and I was fucking scared though, dude. I used to be able to like, I used to be able to hit spots and like go into this like mode where I just like kind of forget. I like, I'll be super scared. But once the winch is pulling me in, just like blank mind, like in, in the zone. And I like can't do that anymore. I like, I'll be all tripping like the whole time. I'm like, just I don't know, just because I'm worried, because I'm worried about hitting my head. But yeah, it definitely played a, f a factor in what I did. I kind of decided I'm not going to hit any more spots where I go up in the air high and come back down. Like where I'm going to launch up like 15 feet up onto something and come down. I'm like that. I probably shouldn't do shit like that anymore. If I want to start high and drop low, probably better. You know what I mean? But like the whole going up and down kind of makes more of a risk. It's kind of what I've determined. I mean, who the fuck knows? I could hit my head doing anything, you know, but. Yeah, but I think you're right because with the level you're at rail wise, you probably won't hit your head with a, a rail trick that isn't too gnarly or too, I don't want to say gnarly, but too big in terms well, of like size. Yeah, if the rail isn't like not that was like my ender clip of my segment in in most gutter. That was after I hit my head and I was like it's just a it was just a little DFD where I did that front up back three up. Mm -hmm. And that was like after hitting my head. I'm like, yeah, I can do shit like that still cuz there's not really much risk doing that, you know. Yeah, ex exactly. Like there might be people that would try that trick, the front swap to back three swap that would get wrecked. But that's exactly my point where In your case, at your level, that's the kind of trick where you're like, oh, that's safe. Yeah, at least the spot is safe, you know? Yeah. Obviously, I could do it on like a huge, try it on a huge rail and get played. But, you know, on a smaller rail like that, it's like, all right, it's still like a, a valid shot. Yeah. Well, let's get into the most gutter seg because yeah. they would props on that segment because it's, uh, Thanks, I think, man. Do, you, do you think it's your best one you've ever done? Dude, I don't even know, man. I, you know, editing the movie and stuff too. I watch it all so much that by the time we're like done editing it, I'm almost like, is this shit even sick? Like, I don't, I don't even know. I'm like, I can't even fucking tell anymore if this is good or not. Like, I watch it too much. Well, on my end, I always wonder if there's a thing with recency. You know, the, the most recent thing you watch always seems better. Yeah. But I, I do think it's your best segment. Sweet. Well, thanks. I'm I'm glad to hear it because I was literally, I think I had like five clips before I hit my head and I was like, uh, that might be it. I'm like done. <laughs> like, you know, I was pretty over this shit at that point. Well, in terms of big spots, tech tricks, just everything being super clean, I think your style has really evolved through the years where now it's like everything is super clean and there's a lot of variety in there. Some jumps, some rails, some transfers. There's everything basically. Yeah, and it's it's funny how that kind of works because like 
it's not like I really plan it out that much. You know, you kind of mm-hmm. find stuff and figure out what you want to do. But I think, you know, as time goes on, I have to get like pickier with what what I want to do and what I want to show. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I can't just be doing the same shit I always do. Or like, if it's even a little bit loose, it's like, nope, I'm going to go do it. You know, however many more time, times till I get it exactly how I want it. The opener shot really made me laugh and because yeah. the way it's edited is really funny because you wait 20 seconds wondering what's coming uh-huh. and the actual trick is a banger. It made me laugh because you're not a jump guy. Like you won't get into big air at X Games, but you're still good. Like you, you, you do dubs on jumps and all that stuff. And yeah. there, there's also the um, head injury part where you're like, okay, you're towing in with a winch, reverting last second, doing a switch dub 10 on a street feature yeah like how did you think of that and how did you motivate yourself to do it knowing like <laughs> and with all that mindset of like is it worth it to see if anything like j- doing jump tricks is almost like less risky because you you go in the air it's just you're in the air and you land it's not like you got to balance on a rail or you got to time it at like i don't know almost doing that is like not as sketchy as some of the other shit the revert the jump before it was really sketchy that was the part that i didn't think it was going to work so initially we built that jump and i just wanted to do a switch 10 blunt like a singular corked switch 10 blunt and the jump we built had way too much pop on it Mm. and i i went up i did like two switch sevens and then and the jump would just like fucking launch like at first i didn't even think i was going to hit it switch i winched into it once And I was like, there's no way I can go switch off this. It's not going to happen. And then I did it and I did a two switch sevens. And then I was like, all right, I'm going to just try to do the switch 10. And I end up doing a switch cork nine, like a, almost like a D spin mm. and just over rotate and land on my back. And I'm like, this jump has way too much pop. I can't, I'm like, the only way I'm doing a 10 is if I do a double. And I like uh, Calvin and then our homie Jack Pepper, they were filming like Calvin was at the bottom and Jack was way at the side. And then Pete was running winch. And I hike back up and I look at him. I'm like, dude, it's only one way I'm doing a switch 10 is if I do a dub. And it, it, he was the only one who knows. They're, they all like are on headphones together. I'm like, yo, just don't tell him because whatever. It'd be funny. Just don't tell him I'm doing this. And then I just did it. I did it just once. That was it. It's uh, the type of gnarly trick where I guess you have to put your, your head into it of really committing. And it, it must be sketchy if like you don't lend it and you're like, okay, I have to go again and try that again. Well, I went, I went back up to, I was like, I was like, fuck, I could do this. I, I was like, I could do it better. And I went back up. I'm like, I'm going to do it again. I was going to do it again just to like try to make it a little cleaner. Mm. And then I remember I jumped in and just did like a huge switch seven with like a spread ego. And I was like, nope, fuck that shit. I'm not doing that again. It was definitely like a spur of the moment decision kind of. I came up and I'm like, huh, I guess I'll do it. I don't know. The trick is super good. Like, I feel you, like, you, there might be a thinking of, oh, I could make it a bit better, but still, like, one try, you got it. That's so dope. And the in-run shot of the, the trick is so crazy because we see you coming in forward and your revert is basically, like, what, 10 feet before the jump? 15 feet? Yeah, like, maybe. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, that was the sketch part about it. That was, that's what I like about it. If it wasn't, I don't know. I don't really think doing, like, a, Just a jump like that. It's kind of whack, honestly. Like, just hitting, like, a jump in the street that didn't really, like, all right, yeah, it's over a fence, but, like, whatever. Yeah. But but that's what makes me like that shot because it's, like, the top angle just looks fucked up because I'm just, like, the last second hop. Which shot in the part stands out as, um, I guess, it can be whatever, like, your favorite or the one that, that was the hardest to get? Dude, I don't know. There's so many. I don't really know. It's hard because I... I don't know, just because I look at it all so much, and mm-hmm. I don't really know. Maybe that rail transfer, because that that one little rail down there was so skinny, I was just scared it was going to break the whole time I was doing it. Where I hit that the flat rail and transferred down to that mm-hmm. down rail, right? Um, but then also that three swap I did on that like little C dot. It was like little curvy quad kink. That one is probably one of my favorites, just because of the story to it. Because I went there, and that's in Des Moines, and I went there. I went there the first night, hit it probably like, I don't know, 80 times or something, which like typically that might be the most I ever hit a spot. Like I feel like usually I hit a spot maybe like 30 times max 
typically like and you get your shot so you, you're uh you're quick like i know a lot of great skiers and everyone has battles sometimes like 30 is quick yeah i usually never i think that might be like one of the few times if not like the only time that i like went back to a spot a different day and did you have the three swap in mind yeah so i was at first i wanted to three swap the middle kink but so i went the first night i was there i I hit that like 80 fucking times. It's like four in the morning. And I, then I like kind of ate shit at the, toward the end. And I'm like, all right, like we got to go home. Like I'll come back, whatever. And yeah, it's like four in the morning. I go back two days later. I slide the rail once. I slide half of it one time. And I'm like, all right, Calvin, start filming. First shot, Calvin film. Second hit, I just did the three swap. And then Damn. left. Yeah. So it was like, that's why everyone, like there's the clips of them all freaking out. Cause like, We go back and everyone's like, fuck, we're going to be here till 4 a.m. again because we had to hit that one late night. And yeah, I literally just did it like first try <laughs> the next night, which is crazy. Dude, what do you think made the difference? Is it just like plain luck or? I think it's just luck, man. It's when you're doing that shit, it's like as long as I'm balanced up, like I can do the three swap like every time. You know what I mean? As long as I'm centered up and can get that grip. And yeah, I think it's just luck. And I think there's something to like, Like the more I try it, you know, you get more burnt out, but also I just feel like I'm not, I don't know, the fresher almost you are, it's like better. Yeah. That's something that happened a lot when I filmed street was it seemed like either the skier would get the shot in the first 30 try or he would get it after 80 plus like the in between in the middle is always like, yeah, if, if you're getting at that point you're not going to get it. You'll have to work harder and it'll get like, there's a, a down part at the middle. Yeah, there is. I mean, and the, yeah, besides that one, the biggest time I had that was, and I talked about this when I did the level one podcast, but um, where it was my last shot of my real ski, it was that huge, like eight kink. Like that thing's probably like 200 feet long. Mm -hmm. The shot, you can't really tell. It was, you know, if you filled it from the side or something, you'd see it's really long. because Will Wesson hit that same rail and his yep. real ski just slid it. But, um, Like that two to switch I did, oh, uh, I'd probably right before it came off at the first kink, like seven hits in a row came off at the first kink. And then I was walking back and uh, Benny Smith and Swadberg were helping me with it. And I walked back, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna try this like five more times. If I don't get it, like I'm coming back. And he's like, no, you got it right here. And after literally after falling off the first kink, Like seven times in a row, I just go in and just did it. It's like, I don't know. It's shit's random. You know? And it's, it's that one is like a perfect shot. You're like chilling through every kink. There, that rail is gnarly also because there's kind of a closeout at the end. Like the rail turns a bit, 90 degrees. Yeah, there's like a little closeout then. And also along the whole rail, the support beams are like, It has weird supports that are to the side of the rail that if you were like tail press too hard, you would mm -hmm. like, you would catch the support beam. So you couldn't rock too much or otherwise you'd clip it on the side. So it was a weird rail for sure. On that 270 on, on that eight kink, you can see that it's the end of the day. Like you didn't have that much try left before there was no light and it was like, you have to get it. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And that was the second spot I hit that day. I hit Yeah, I got, oh, I forget which clip it was. It was either my opener shot or one. I did a front swap to the donkey on the, another like eight kink. I forget because they're all in the same area. But yeah, that was my like second clip that day too. Yeah, that lip on to late switch up on the last king was so dope. It almost looked like a park trick where you don't get those kind of tricks in street where just getting the rail is so hard, but that was one of my favorites of your edit where not only is the rail hard, but you're like dropping in a late switch up as if it was just a donkey in the park. Yeah. That was like a spur of the moment decision while I was on the rail. Cause I don't know what my plan was. Honestly, I was just going to like slide it or something, but I'm on there. I was like, Oh fuck it. I'm just do a switch up. Like, well at first I wanted that. That was the rail I wanted to two to switch at first. Mm. Cause they were, they were both eight kinks, but I tried it a couple of times and it was like the kinks were too steep that it was like, it made it really hard. Like I'd two in and almost just land on the flat. The, yeah. You know? So, and they were, yeah, they both were in the same town. So they both were like near each other. And I was, I was only going to hit one of them, but then it, it ended up where I was like, all right, I did this front stop, I guess. I guess I'll go try to two into this other one. 
there was a point where uh, one skier could have three or four shots on the same rail. Like it seemed oh. like getting as m as many shots as you could was a thing, and it got to a point where it's like, well, I get one good shot that I'm stoked on, and that's enough. Like I don't want to have three shots on one rail. Yeah, I think I think you could do if it's different enough or it makes sense. I feel like two is fine, but any mm -hmm. more than that, I don't like to do that. I'd rather just get the shot. And that's it. Also, like, we don't really like to either, like, share spots. Because I hate when you – and we will some. But I hate in, like, movies where you see the same spot keep coming up. Like, I forget. I think it's one of those, like, four by nine movies. They all – everyone hit this, like – some, like, retaining wall or some shit. It's like a, in, I think it's, like, All Damn Day is the movie, I think. And it's, like, there's, like, a retaining wall that I swear is in every single segment. And that shit's whack. That annoys me. <laughs> like, I don't know. Yeah. But, well, it's – um. And it's a different time. I, obviously, it's a you gotta, you know. But it's definitely a plus for you guys to actually put in the work to do different spots for everyone because that's something I noticed in most gutter. Um, I guess it'd be cool if you tell me more about it. But to me, from what I know about your crew, it seems like you're all together for the whole season just getting the movie done. And almost everyone, like there's no repetitions in spots. Like the spots Pete has and... Calvin has me and Pete shared me and Pete shared one spot. Yeah, that's it. So it's really cool that that means that there's a lot of teamwork involved where at one night you say, okay, Pete, that's your spot. And then everyone helps and he gets his shot. So, um, yeah, tell me about that, that crew mentality. It reminds me a lot of stepped. Yeah. I mean, that's how it is. It's like, I just, I think overall for the sake of the movie, I don't like seeing the same spots a bunch. So it's like, all right, even if sometimes there'll be a spot where I'm like, damn, I kind of want to hit this, but like, oh, Calvin's going to hit it. I'm like, I'm like, all right, that's fine. You got it. Like, I'm going to just not do it, you know, because I think for the sake of the whole movie, it's better. Um, and yeah, I mean, dude, we'll go like, I, I think to make most gutter, man, I think like, I bet you we did less than 40 days, probably like 30 something days that we actually like shot. And we did a good bit in Denver, which was nice because Denver actually got snow this last year. Dude, we'll go on trips and just like we'll get like three or four clips a day. Like we'll have like kind of a rotation and just like ski all day and then into the night, just like go fucking hard. And it's it's draining, man, because oh, you know, you're mostly just shoveling. <laughs> like I mostly just shovel and film. Like you know, yeah. Like I remember the most I did was three spots a day at some point. Like you wake up early, you do one in the morning, you get the shot, eat lunch, get another one in the afternoon eat supper and then set up the lights and do one at night. But that's like something you can't really, you can't do that too much in repeat because you're, you're drained out. Like, oh yeah. It's just terrible. <laughs> But, and it, it wouldn't be like that often. Like there's, we probably had like two or three days total that we got four clips in a day. And even three was low. Like we would at least get two though. Like every day we're on a trip for sure. Mm -hmm. But I guess if, not every skier hits it, then it helps. Because while someone is like draining energy in the morning, you still have yours to get your shot afterwards. Yeah. If it's if it's one guy per spot, and it's also more quick. Because I've done spots in my life where there's four guys hitting the same spot, and then it's just long for nothing because everyone's waiting after another to hit it. No, yeah, I get yeah. Because if we did, if I do think we shared a few, I shared two. I shared two spots with Calvin because he also did a dub under flip on that same jump. So we both hit that, and then. We both hit that dub kink too that I did the front up back three because he lit two disastered it. Yeah. And then it was me and Pete on that one, just like a flat rail with a drop. But so a little more than we typically would do. But I think that's like it for the whole movie. But uh but it does. It gets to the point where it's like, yeah, you're waiting. It's like, all right, like get your clip because I'm trying to ski before. It's like I'm just sitting around, you know. Yeah. You don't want to be sitting around super long. Like you just want to be skiing and get it done. So that can be nerve wracking. Is there some spots where you had to do like rock, paper, scissors? Because you know you don't want to repeat it, but then both or like a lot of guys want have a trick in mind or want to do it? No, not really. I guess me and Pete did rock, paper, scissors. Who was going to hit that drop rail first? But that was it, which that was sketchy because there's like a whole like car meet thing, like a, where people like have cars and meet in a parking lot and like race them. And we're there at like, we're there at like 2 a.m. And there's guys just fly because we you land into a busy road and it's like that's why we had to do it late and there's guys just flying by in cars doing like a hundred while we're trying to hit this and it was so like so terrible because we went there like two nights or a night before 
and the winch just didn't start. We built it all. We're like waiting. We're like, all right, I'm going to wait till it's a little later, less traffic. I'm like, all right, let's go, go do it. The winch just doesn't start. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And wouldn't turn on. Damn. So then we went back two days later. and So that spot is like at a Fast and Furious Vin Diesel Paul Walker spot? Dude, it, at least that night it was. It's at a Walmart. It's not like it's a, you know, not typically, but it was like, damn, the first night was just so good. And then we go back the ni other night and it's like, oh, there's like fucking car races going on. Dude, that would have been crazy to uh, have shots with the neon lights and with, with the, them guys reacting to you. Well, dude, then also, and it was over in like kind of a sketchier part of town. And uh, then there's some guy too that was there that's, that's running around like freaking out asking us to help him that there's like two guys after him that are gonna like kill him he's like dude they're gonna shoot me man and he's like tripping running all around i'm like dude they're gonna come here and shoot you get the fuck away from us i don't want to have anything to do with this and that was like a whole distraction too plus the cars and like definitely was like a stressful spot just into man. the road and all that but yeah the the encounters that you have in street is like either it's super cool and mellow or either it's always like the sketchiest thing like i remember maybe around the refresh years level one had their old camera gear stolen because they were they were filming at a ghetto area and they all went they had two cameras let's say and they went to one to check out a shot and when they came back basically their whole camera gear was gone that's uh, yeah you can't ever leave that shit i know calvin years ago in new york city before we really made movies, but he was skiing some street there. And he was like back in Jersey with me and I didn't go for some reason. He was with my other friend, Jake. And yeah, he sat like his, it was like a GH3 or something. Like this was years ago. And yeah, he sat it somewhere like on a car and it, someone nabbed it real quick and like didn't even notice till like a bit later. And uh, I don't know, you know, you gotta always, you gotta, gotta always be keeping track of that shit. You know, when we go to street spots, I always keep my, I always keep it in my backpack and I always keep my backpack on my back because it's like, yeah. I'm not leaving it anywhere. Yeah, you can't. You really can't. Um, yeah. How was your interactions with people this year? Because in every movie you've done, you always put some shots of that. There's some in older movies that like people want to fight you. Some, yeah, some crazy ladies. Up. That yeah. lady in Bangla, that shit was unreal. That shit was so funny. Um, yeah, tell me about that because I re re watching your old movies that made me laugh a lot because you're basically talking with strangers and they're all stoked and then you turn the camera and there's that lady that like looks out of her mind. Yeah, that was a, it was in Boston at a Verizon store and the two other guys were employees and they were like hyped on it. We're just talking like, yeah, I'll go skiing. Like I go to the bar mostly and like shit like that. All Boston is fuck. And, uh, And they were super cool. They're like filming me on their work iPads and stuff. And then I don't know what was wrong with this lady. She comes out and is like furious out of nowhere. That was super funny. She like attacked Calvin. Cal she like attacked Cal like onto like the hood of the car. And he's like, that. Calvin filmed all that. So he's holding the camera still. Ash, she's like attacking him. That shit was hilarious. And then the cops came. They pulled up. Literally, he just, Calvin just walks over to the cops. The cops don't even get out of the car. They gave like... You know, when you get, when you're in like real cities, like Chicago, New York, Boston, like they don't give a shit. Like the cops don't, they're like, oh, you got to go. And we're like, yeah, we know, like we're packing up. Mm -hmm. And he's like, all right, cool. And just doesn't even step foot out of the car. Yeah. Pulls off. Like he didn't fucking care. You know, it's like, oh, you got some kids skiing, like word, like they, they have bigger fish to fry. Yeah. It's like, yeah, like real crimes to deal with, you know? Like, yeah. And plus, even if she wanted to do something, he's going to be like, well, she assaulted me. Yeah. What? Yeah. Literally. Uh, I don't know what's up with some people, dude. There's some people that get so butthurt and mad about this stuff. It's like, dude, just go on with your day. Don't fucking worry about us. Like, yeah. uh, you know. But that lady was like the the meme of a Karen. Yeah, but like she was like big too, like a big lady. Yeah, that shit was hilarious. Nothing, nothing too crazy like that happened this year. But we had some like good interactions like in milwaukee this random lady randomly she well she walked by our spot and was super interested and like we talked to her and stuff and she watched her while then randomly two days later she just happens to walk by another spot we're hitting and then we saw like a random kid who's in the movie who had donated to our van fund mm -hmm. he randomly saw us in milwaukee and pulled up which was super sick the one that i thought was the coolest like 
just made me happy watching it was uh, the Asian guy that was yeah. hyped about Calvin's front flip. Were you there at that encounter? Yeah, that was that was crazy. Well, I didn't even realize I wasn't like I must have not been right there when because Calvin filmed all that stuff, and I must have not been right there. But then when I saw the footage, like I was there, but I was like down at the van or doing something else. Yeah, that shit was too funny. I was like, just almost like it was like almost too stereotypical. Like in a way, I was like, just crazy how the dudes. I was like, you know, I don't know, not to be like racist or anything. Cause I'm not, cause I'm not, but it almost felt like I was like, holy shit, this dude sounds like, like a South Park character. Or yeah. And I was like, holy shit, this, that footage is so good though. And that guy was so hyped. Like he hung out like the whole time. The character from shitty walk. Yeah. Literally though, like his voice, it was so just like stereotypical that I was like, this footage is insane. So funny. A thing that was funny is he was talking in uh it was he was right to say that he was saying like you guys are mathematicians it seems yeah Cal calculating the distance and everything and i know from out an outside perspective it can seem that way but knowing w what we do it's like there is no calculation at all it's just like go for it and it, it will work i guess yeah i guess you know the more you do it you're good at gauging stuff right but it's you're all just guessing I, i'm fucking terrible at math like you know i don't you know like yeah it is funny that that's what It makes sense that he would think that. We could get into like big thinking about the distance and the angle of a jump. And most of the time, it's just like you're shaping it, scraping and saying like, oh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, you hit it and you realize, oh, you got to ch change it a little bit or whatever. You get a mistake, you fix it, another one, and then, okay, it's good. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's fun. That took so much fucking work to build that thing. <laughs> Because we had to carry all the snow up these stairs on there. And like you see in the, right after that clip, there's the in run. That's like nothing. Water. It's, all, it's all just melting. Yeah. It's like there was not much snow there. That whole trip, we went to Chicago, then to Milwaukee. And that whole time for like two weeks, we're just like scraping up piles. There was like no snow like anywhere in the country, you know? There's some spots like that that I saw you guys doing that I was really stoked on because that front flip is huge and it's super though, but it's also, I think that same spot was hit by LJ in level one back in the days. Like maybe. I think like the rail of yeah, it. Yeah, the C rail. You guys think of doing a jump and there's no snow. So you have to work super hard to get the snow there. And you're still like, yeah, let's put in the work. It'll be worth it. Yeah. And I mean, we built the jump with a picnic table and like two barrels of hay helped. Helped is like the base for the jump, which also we did. We did a lot. We, did a lot of stuff like that, like that uh, red rainbow rail that I did the front six off of. We had like, I think 23 pallets under that thing in that jump, like just a big ass stack of pallets. We like make shifted together for that. Yeah. That shot is so dope. I think, is it possible that you posted a tease on Instagram with all the pallets? Cause I think I saw that this winter and was like, what are you guys doing? Maybe. I, yeah, I think I did. I think I took a picture of just the jump on my story in like the middle like when we did it in winter and i just took because i like this looks fucking ridiculous like and that's like the perfect example of a spot where you can only go at night because it seems like it's the entrance of a business yeah it was like a it was a chow's gymnastics was the was the business in des moines if anyone wants to go there <laughs> chow's gymnastics in des moines and we stole all the pallets from like there's like warehouses nearby and we just would take shuttle laps in the van and just brought all these pallets over there yeah and the shot is so sick it's just a a straight shot static shot yeah where you just see the in run the trick and the landing and there's just chow's gymnastics yeah it's such a dope visual yeah that was my first hit on it i like did one of those like backseat launch like I took off backseat and just aired over the whole thing flailing. It was so loose. You mentioned that quickly. You guys are basically traveling year round with a van. Yeah. Tra traveling circus style. And from what I understand, it broke down or there were some issues that you had to fix and you did a GoFundMe last summer. Well, so what happened was we had a different van that we bought mm. and it was parked outside of my house in Denver. And these people were evading the cops, like in a cop chase. And they were f going like 70 down a residential road that like you should drive like 20 or 15 miles on. Like, you know what I mean? They're doing 70 miles an hour and they bottomed out at the end of the road in like a, they're in like a Camaro or some shit. 
And they bottomed out and swerved and hit the van, pushed it like 10 feet to the side onto someone's lawn and just totaled the van. And then they all hopped out and ran. They were like drunk too, like drunk and evading the cops. And the car, the car wasn't registered or insured. So we pretty much just got fucked mm. on the car, on the van. So that's why we did it to get a new one. We're like, literally, we just got fucked on the van. Like it was, that was why the, the, the car had last been registered to a prison. Cause I guess when you live in, when you're in prison, I guess that's like your address and you can like register a vehicle okay. to prison, I guess. I never heard of it till this, but that's a thing apparently. But yeah, it, it hadn't been insured or registered since 2016 and it was yeah registered to a prison and these people all get out and run. So that must be weird if you guys get pulled over while driving because they're like, they ask you for your registration and then it's linked to a prison? Well, no, no. So the people who crashed into the van mm, okay. who were evading the cops, they were registered to a prison. And okay, no okay. One, so because they didn't have insurance or anything, we just got, and I didn't have, we didn't have coverage that covered that. Mm. How did that whole GoFundMe thing go? It went good. People were happy to donate, which is dope. You know, you get a lot of people together. And how much, uh, how much fun did you end up getting? Uh, I think like it was like 9,000 something, which was sick, which is pretty damn good. Yeah. And even though they're older vans, they, those Astro vans are like super sought after and hard. They're like hard to find mm -hmm. because, because they stopped making them in like 2005, I think. I think that can maybe lead us into a, a another subject, which is you guys seem like you've really get a lot of love from the public because I think in our era where ski movies are free and a lot of content is free, it's really hard to get people to put out their credit card and give some money. And if you guys manage to get 9,000 for your van, it seems like people are really into Strictly and into you guys that you and Calvin and Pete and the other guys Do you notice that? Like, yeah, I mean, how, how do you think that came about of people being that stoked on you guys on your crew? I, I honestly, I don't even know. It's it's so sick though that people are like, we're all so thankful, and it is crazy. It is pretty awesome to see, you know, like just skiers that are down for it. And I guess yeah, something has to do with it, probably with us putting out high quality stuff like for free. And we we really believe in that because we had like talked about selling selling the movie before and i was like i don't i don't know i like i don't really want to do that like whatever we'll we'll pitch all this to sponsors and get them to mm -hmm. you know fund it so we can make it free so we don't so we don't have to charge for it you know like were you getting demotivated at some point because you've been having a lot of success in the past years with sponsors that we'll get to talk about and movies and strictly and x games but to me it I, I almost felt bad for you at a point because I, I had seen you and I was seeing your edits and I knew you were good. But it seems like you got in at a weird place where there a lot of crew stopped making movies. There wasn't Poor Boys, there wasn't 4x9, there wasn't Stepped. And it seems like a guy like you wasn't getting his chance. And I guess there might have been a time kind of after some of that, like, damn, you know, thinking that, oh, that's going to like win this and it's going to help launch the career or whatever. So I guess there was maybe a small point of it, but I don't know. Start, st stuff started just picking up with like gibberish was huge too, like getting with them and those guys are the best. And that I feel like helped with some of the motivation, kind of got us going. Like we made the movies for them, like banged up and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. just to see like all the love we got on that, I think was good motivation. And then just... Yeah, you didn't think uh, too ahead of yourself. You were just like each season at a time. Yeah, like at first I didn't even want to do the thing with Strictly. I just wanted to like I just wanted to like make another movie with Calvin mm -hmm. and do it how we wanted to do it. Seeing the the list of writers, it seems like it was just your crew going in and becoming Strictly because it's it's basically the same writers as you were doing your movies before. Yeah, so Strictly was like Andrew Mildenberger. It was his thing. He went to film school at Boulder. And he had filmed a bunch of, he would film a bunch of park edits with like Parker Norvell and Benny Smith. And it was pretty much them that kind of like started the thing. And then he was like, after we teamed up for the premiere where we premiered banged up in their movie, strictly business, Andrew was like, I want to get more street stuff going. Like, and like brought Calvin in kind of, and Calvin was like, I want to do this. because I want to have like the high, the higher production value. Cause like mm -hmm. we didn't, we didn't know what we were doing. And like, over those years is when I really learned how to use a camera like better. And, um, 
he wanted to do that. And I, I, there was a point where I'm like, I didn't want to do that. I'm like, don't do this shit, Calvin. Like, let's do our own thing still. But I'm glad we did. It all kind of fell into place. I think it helps a lot when you have people helping out with the filming and editing. Yeah. The whole production value that you've gotten in the last three years is really nice. Yeah, it, it for sure is. And those, yeah, and they were like Gavin and Andrew, both great filmers. And like Gavin then, because most gutter, I film like pretty much me and Calvin pretty much. I took the lead on it, but it was just me and Calvin filmed it. Like, So it wasn't either Andrew or Gavin? No, neither of them. And, and Andrew filmed one clip. That really? Was yeah, that was it. So I, I filmed like most of it. And then Calvin, and then like everyone would use a camera some, but pretty much it was me and Calvin. Like I didn't run the winch once, you know, I'd never like Damn. Seamus and like Pete did that. But um, you guys did a good job. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. And a lot of that is I've all, and I've always used cameras. Like even when I was little, I'd make rollerblade videos, stuff like that. Like I've used cameras my whole life. And like I filmed, me and Calvin filmed banged up too. And like edited banged up. Mm -hmm. um, well, to be honest, there's a world of difference between the two. Uh, well, I was going to say like, we just, I didn't even know any, I knew no settings, you know, I knew about like angles and stuff, right. I could always kind of do that pretty good. But like, I didn't know any camera settings with like a DSLR. I always would use like a dad cam, you know, so with banged up, I just like cranked the ISO and all the wheels till it looked okay. I didn't know about, you know, F stop and like shutters, all that shit. I knew nothing. So then when we filmed welcome, I don't know, Gavin coached me like a lot. Like I, I still filmed even in like uh, Bermuda and welcome. Like I still filmed a lot. Like I probably filmed like almost half the street stuff in Bermuda with, with Gavin by my side, kind of coaching me. So then it was good that like come this year, I'm like, all right, I've, I've got it where I can do this and kind of run the whole thing and set cameras and all that stuff. And same with Calvin. Calvin learned a lot too. And it's, so, you know, the both of us just learned a bunch more where we felt good enough to like go into this, to be able to film it up to par with like the strict, the strictly quality. Well, that's really dope. because I, I didn't think it was you guys. I thought it was uh, Gavin and, Ru and uh, Andrew. No, yeah. Gavin had nothing to do with it at all. And Andrew, Andrew filmed one clip. Andrew helped though on the back end. Like, well, like we edited the whole thing too. And then passed it to Andrew who then stabilized stuff and fixed the ramps like the speed ramp and did audio and like color. But we, I mean, we did a little bit of that stuff. Like we did as much as we possibly could editing. And like, I've had years of experience with premiere and stuff like that, but like obviously nothing like Andrew, like Andrew's great at all that. So you guys really have a stepped vibe, the tightly knit friends that are, working both in front and behind the lens and producing high quality stuff. Yeah, I guess. Well, that was the, that was my main thing when we went, when we kind of transferred over and we started the strictly thing was that was why I didn't want to do it at first. Cause I'm like, I want to edit this. I want to make it how I want it to be. You know what I mean? Which was dope that we, for other reasons and stuff that we ended up making three different movies, but I'd kind of always wanted to go back to making something like banged up which was sick that we were able to do that with most gutter just at like a higher level. I'm not sure if I'm remembering right. Is banged up the one where you guys hit street in New York city? No, that was before that's that 70, 30. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was the, that was the year before New York city seems like the most uninviting place to hit street. And th there was a lot of six spots in there. Dude, there's so many spots. Well, so Estrada, our homie, RIP, he was like an OG rollerblader dude. So he knew a lot of these spots and we went there and stayed with him and he showed us around and I had known him before too. I had met him when I was in high school actually, because I live pretty close to New York city, but yeah, I mean, it's dope there. because you know, they got bigger shit to do. They don't in New York city, you could get away with doing fucking anything like Denver. It's not like that. You'll get kicked out and stuff, but like New York city, you literally could do whatever the fuck you want and nobody cares. Like there was the, it was the last clip in that movie where I, hit the, like, it was like a transfer into this long kink rail. Mm -hmm. Um, there was literally like a cop standing across the street, watching me saw tree branches off this tree and just didn't even walk over, or give two shits. And I'm like, I remember like, all right, I guess I'm going to like do this. And I hop up there and I'm sawing branches off this tree with a cop watching and nothing like whatever. As a, as someone who's never been to New York city, like I've been once, but didn't really look around is all the spots kind of 
in the Central Park area? It, it all seems like Central Park ish. I mean, dude, it's so big. I'm sure we only tapped into probably like fucking ten percent of it, you know. Like, and we were there for like eleven days. And but was that it? Was that Central Park? No, Calvin hit one spot in Central Park, but no, um, it was all like more Harlem. So Estrada lived. Estrada lived in East Harlem. So we kind of just stayed around there. Cause I mean, dude, in a car, it's a pain in the ass. It'll take you 30 minutes to drive three miles. You know, it's like, is that a spot where you'd go back? Yeah, for sure. If it made sense, it's just fucking far now coming from Colorado. Like you never know how long the snow is going to last or anything. Like we definitely sent it when we went out there too. We were so, we were paying for all our own stuff at that point. Like mm -hmm. we were funding it all. And so poor, like I remember me and Calvin like covered, for our homie, Mike, Mike Coppola, we like, he was back home in Jersey and we, we like covered for him. He did a maid job and we like cleaned like five houses real quick, made maybe like 600 bucks each or something like that. And we we're like, fuck it, let's go. And we just sent it, just hopped in the car and sent, sent it. <laughs> wow. It's now it's like, it's just so far. Like this year we didn't really go too far. The furthest we went was like Chicago. Well, it's still a good drive. Yeah, like 14 hours, which it's not that. Whatever, it's not like – I well, I also drove to New York in a blizzard, so it should have been like 25, 28 hours, and it took us like 30-something. I'm driving down I-80, seeing flipped over semi-trucks, and I'm in like my Subaru Outback, and I'm driving down there just with like a foot of snow in the highway, just in the middle of the road, just like surfing through this snow. Yeah, that's something that I talk often with guys from the U.S. is how much – us in Quebec, everything is close. Like we don't go further. Like we stay in the province. So yeah. we know all the stuff. It's all within a reasonable driving distance. And so we have all summer long to see what we wanted or what would be doable. And then we just do it in the winter versus yeah. you guys. It seems more like an adventure. Like, hey, there's snow in Des Moines. Let's spend like maybe two days driving across the city to find something because we've never been. Or yeah. how is it for you guys driving to new cities like that? Yeah, that's how we do it pretty much. We just drive there. We'll scope around the first day. Usually, like, we find stuff pretty quick. Like, Pete's really good at finding shit that I wouldn't look at and thinks a spot. So he always finds a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, it, like, f as far as Denver spots, we have, like, you know, we find stuff all the time and have, like, a log of all that. So at least when it snows here, we're like, all right, we know what we're going to do, kind of. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, other times, like, we just drive there, get there. Is there snow in a city? We'll just go and just figure it out. Is that stressful at all for you guys? We have X amount of days. We need to get it done. Fuck, we need to find something. <laughs> yeah, it definitely has been, but not, it has been at points, but like not really. I don't know. It just, it works. It seems to just work out. Someone's going to find something, you know what I mean? And as long as we're filming something, that's good, you know? You kind of got to keep the stress level down and, I have faith that everything will work out. Yeah, which it always does. I mean, dude, we went to Omaha this year, and that's where I knocked myself out. So that I only I hit that one spot in Omaha, knocked myself out, didn't ski for a whole month. I just filmed for a month. And um, yeah, because the doctor's like, oh, give it two weeks. And I'm like, dude, bullshit. You guys don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, I'm waiting a month. Like, I'm not messing around. You know, like I told you about the, how mm -hmm. I, with the X Games, I hit my head two weeks later and got messed up again. And um But yeah, so that trip was a bust though, dude. We were there for like a whole week. I think Pete got, Pete might've got one or two clips and Calvin hit like three spots and didn't get a single shot. I knocked myself out. We were there for like seven days and got like a clip or two. And I was like, I was like, that shit sucked. That was when I was like, all right, fuck this. What am I even doing? Like, why am I even like, this isn't worth it. I don't get paid enough to do this bullshit because this actually sucks. But You know, it works out in the end. I mean, that trip, it like didn't. That trip was terrible. But, you know, come the end of the year, it all falls into place and worked out. Yeah, you have some trips where you get so many shots, then some where you don't get any almost, and then it all kind of evens out. Oh, yeah. I think we were when we were in Chicago. So after that trip, we went to Chicago, and I just filmed the whole time. I didn't ski in Chicago at all last year. And, um, dude, I think with everyone else, I think we got like – I think we got like 15 shots in like maybe f like six days or something like that. 
which was that's sick. Dope. Yeah, that's where it really came together. We were just like stacking, just going hard. And also that was Seamus too. He Seamus was definitely like hungry to get after it, and he got a lot of shots for sure. Which was sick though, and I was stoked too, just to be like filming it because I'm like, all right, I'm just chilling, just shoveling, filming. Like I don't have to stress out about skiing or doing something gnarly. Seamus was one of my standout for the movie. Like he's been known since he was a kid. Like he was in gibberish edits when he was five, it seems. Yeah. But like he had a lot of bangers this year. I mean, dude, he'd been hitting streets since he was like 12. I, I didn't even put skis on my feet till I was 12 ever. And uh, yeah, dude. And yeah. And well, also we hadn't filmed with him since like banged up. And so it'd been a couple of years and he definitely was ambitious and the kid's really good too. And he just like, somehow he just like freestyles his shit. I swear he'll have like no plan and just like, pull some shit out of nowhere and but he's good man yeah he had a he had a lot of shots that made me go whoa yeah I did. like um there's this one closeout rail i think it's in minnesota where he does a lip on back six and Dude. it's <laughs> it's huge <laughs> yeah we didn't oliver film that we weren't even there that was like the zoot space homies filmed that and they just gave us the footage because seamus wanted it all to be in mm -hmm. in one segment yeah that was fucked up because a lot of people have hit that spot But he just went like, because I think Keegan has a clip where he front sixed it. Mm -hmm. Literally makes it, Keegan's shot look like tiny. He literally, Seamus went like 20 feet further, almost landed in the road. And like, yeah. it, it was kind of loose, but like, it was so big that like, whatever. It was, <laughs> that shit was crazy. Yeah, that's the exact definition of loose but lit. Yeah, I wasn't there, but I remember he, after it happened, he like texted me the shot. Like, On, onto my phone. I saw it. I'm like, yo, what the f it was It was funny too because it was the same day that Calvin was trying to do a back six off a closeout that was way smaller and couldn't do it. He kept getting played and he was getting so mad. And then we, after he like finally gives up, we go in the car and I get this message from Shamo and I'm like, yo, look at this, Calvin. <laughs> look at this back six Seamus just did. That was fucking huge. And he's like, oh, word. All right. Well, Good thing I didn't waste any more time trying this shit, you know, after seeing that. Yeah, and there's also a shot doing a switch cork five to concrete. It's like, gla dude, that thing was glass. It was like an emblem that was a bunch of, it was concrete with a bunch of, sh like, chunks of glass set into the concrete, dude. It's gnarly. That thing would, like, tear you up. It shredded the sleeve of his hoodie when he fell on it once. And, like, just trying that is so dope. Yeah, well, it's funny. There's, like, some clips in, like, a snowboard film where these dudes just like drop in real slow natty speed and like board slide down it. Mm. It's just funny seeing that. because it's like, just because shame then goes and switch cork fives onto it, like way gnarlier. There's so much good stuff in the movie. I think another one of my standouts is uh, in Pete's segment where there's kind of that, it seems like in a public park, just a, a roof where there's no roofing. There's just metal. Yeah. That shit. That thing's big too. That's in Denver. And he, he just slides it, but there's no trick involved, but there's just the fact of sliding it is sketchy as fuck. When he had that crash where he turns sideways, turns back forward and goes to ski through. I thought I saw, I was filming the back angle and I saw it from like far away and I was like, holy shit. I thought he like, that could have been bad. He got lucky. There, there were some cross supports that he barely rode on. Like if his ski would have went under it, he probably would have like blown his knee or something all tangled up in there, you know? And that, that was not, I remember he was like tripping on that one. He like, didn't want to do it. And I'm like, Pete, you got this, like, do it. We just scraped all this snow together. Like, cause he kept crashing, like just into it and didn't think it was going to work. That one was, yeah, that was definitely like a battle. You're a skier, you're a producer, you're a filmer, you're an editor, but also in those times, you're like a psychologist kind of sports psychologist. <laughs> I, I don't know, man. I guess, you know, I mean, everyone does it where, you know, you'd don't necessarily actually want to do this, but you feel like you like have to do it. Kind of help him. Like, you know his skills, you know he's going to be able to do it. You know he needs that push in the back at that moment to keep going. Right, yeah, at points where it might be that like, yeah, I, like I have more confidence in him than he does in himself, you know, at points. And it happens with all of us. At times, you know, you're always going to doubt yourself mo almost more than your homies will that see you you know, succeed and do know your capabilities almost and have more confidence in you than you do in yourself, which is cool. And that's something really cool about having your crew where you all know each other, you all know each other's skills. And I don't know, you might know that 
you know he can do it you know he'll be bummed if he doesn't get it so you you know you're like okay i'm gonna push you there and you'll be you'll be thanking me afterwards yeah and because also like i want it to happen because my biggest concern will be just for the movie overall i'm like we need this you know mm -hmm. does it bum you at all to have that pressure of the broader picture of the movie because at the basis you're a skier but as you told me like there's trip where you didn't ski at all where you were just filming yeah does that bum you at all or are you stoked on the that aspect of the production no i i like it i like you know producing doing all that like i'm hoping this year to get maybe some more get maybe some more guys in it maybe not ski as i mean we'll see i don't know i think maybe not ski as much but it's hard man i always think too like oh i'm gonna take it easy but it's like it's it's hard to you see something get an idea and i'm like shit i gotta do this yeah i'm hoping to get some more people involved and make more of i want to make it where it's like more just homey put together not like individual segments like kind of just have like a whole mix up of the, the whole movie you know and just get, get more people in it do you have some people in mind i mean so the pow the pow guys so pretty much it's going to be like andrew's going to do his stuff and film all the pow stuff which i'm hoping to like hit a jump or two would be sick to hit like a pow jump but um As far as street, I don't really know. Um, you know, Ryan Stevenson, I want to get him some clips. He's from Jersey. He's the boy, and he's so good. So good, but, like, so underrated for how fucking good he is. Um, yeah, that's, like, the only person that I've really talked to that – I talked to him – I wanted to get him some clips last year, but it just didn't end up working out like that. But uh, mm. So hopefully that – that's really the only one I actually have in mind at this point. One thing that I wanted to talk to you about was the, the sponsor situation. Because you've kind of had a um, not the easiest routes with sponsors. Because a big factor that helps you with what you do is either film crews helping you out, which wasn't really the case. You kind of, you you had kind of to create your own content, and then it's if sponsors back you. You know, there's some people that get a sponsor where, when they're 15 and get like with them for their whole career, and to me it seemed like a bummer because the first big one you got was revision. And as an outsider, it seemed really unclear what happened. It, they kind of appeared, sponsored a lot of skiers, and then disappeared at once. Um, and then you were kind of in your first years of making it. How sketchy was that situation or how much of a bummer was it? Yeah, it was definitely like a bummer. But also, I never really was like too worried. I sent like a couple emails and just got linked up with Jay like pretty quickly. And which is a way better ski and ever like so much better. Like I could actually use like, even with skiing street, I could go by like, I could use it one pair like the whole year. That's crazy. Yeah. And, and be fine. Like my skis, I skied street on last year literally are like still fine. If you just get a base grind, you ski them in the park, be fine. But yeah. That that's leads me into where you're at right now, which is really cool. You got with a brand that I think fits you super well, which is J skis. Um, How was that relationship started or how did it get together? I literally just sent them an email and that, and they were just like down off the bat, like no real questions. They're like, yeah, we're down. Like, let's do it. Just sent me some skis and then yeah. got on from there. Yeah. And th and they're dope. They're sick too. Because you know, you know, it's sick too, to have like their sponsor that I like, like them and gibberish and like who I'm actually like friends with the people that, you know, Mm -hmm. run the company and i actually talk to them frequently enough and like we'll go see them and stuff like that like with gibberish it's easy because they all are in denver but still with jay you know they'll they'll make a point to like get the team together do stuff at hood whatever something that is really cool about jay regarding you is that there's a lot of brands that have gone outside of the park scene or the street scene mm -hmm. and there's less and less pro models it seems Yeah, And I think it's really cool what they did of giving you an opportunity to get your pro model out there because it seems like, to me, back in the days, brand would work end in end with the rider to help each other. And now it seems like there isn't that. So I thought it was really cool when they gave you the chance to have your own pro model. Yeah, super sick. And that was something that I, that I had like thought of when I first started riding for him and like, it took a while to, because I hit him up about it with like a whole proposal and stuff and which it took a bit, but I was like, yeah, if I'm ever going to get this, it's, this makes the most sense. Cause like other companies you need to, 
you need to wait. It'll take them like they have their skis planned out two years ahead. You know what I mean? Where Jay can make them in like make a new ski and have it within like three weeks, mm-hmm. you know? And with how they do all the custom graphics, I'm like, yeah, this like makes sense. What was the process like from your first proposal to the first street rat version? Um, wasn't too bad. That It was pretty rushed because I, I kind of hit them up almost too late, but they were down. Hmm. And that one was pretty rushed. And to be honest, like I was never super hyped on the, like actually on the graphic. It was sick going into the second one because we had more time to plan it out. Like I got, you know, I got a pair like last February or something. So I was able to ski in the street on them some. And, and then their guy, Fank, Mark Fank, he, he designed both skis, but then I think the first one, they kind of outsourced him. And then before we did the second one, they hired him on like full time, just as Jay's like designer. And it was sick. because I got to work just closely with him. We just, a lot more thought and effort went into the, the new ski and he killed it, which was sick. That was like his, I want, I knew I wanted the van on there and stuff, but like the vision, like a lot of it came from Fank because the whole, it's called like rat Fink artwork where they have like, Like if you Google it, you'll see they have like, they show like rat rods, like cars with like drawn with big engines popping out the front. And I didn't even know about that. And he was like, yeah, to get the rat tied in from the year before and stuff. And he like sent me all this art and I'm like, damn, it's pretty sick. Like, all right, let's, let's do it. And that, like, so a lot of that was him, which was super sick though, because it worked out well and he killed it. The artwork is so dope. There's so much detail related to street skiing. There's the rat who seems to be operating a winch. There's the no trespassing fence that is cut off. Yeah. Um, dropping into a rail. Did you have a spot in mind of a rail you wanted to draw or it was just a generic one? No, nah, dude, Fank just like did that. <laughs> it wasn't, I had, I didn't even, he just like did that, threw that in there. That was like a whole extra thing. I like the first one also with the, I like best the second one also, but the the first one with the all black graphic and the, The base with Hungry Days and Thirsty Nights, I thought was really cool. I mean, yeah, they're still doing, like, I, I was still stoked on them. It's not, you know, not to, down, not to like, downplay any of that. But um, I definitely like the new ones a lot. Yeah, with the fence and the horns in it. Yeah, and I was like, I want to get some more color in, too, because the other ones took a while to sell and stuff, too, because I think a lot of times people buying J-Skis want brighter graphics. Although, like, I, if I could pick, I'd just make a fucking solid black pair of skis. You know what I mean? But I think a lot of the customers want something that pops a little more. And that was also a factor in making the new ski. Because I'm like, all right, I need these to like sell a little quicker, which they've been, which is dope. So, Well, I'll be skiing your ski this season. Yeah, and yeah. the graphic has a lot to do with it. I think it's it's a good in-between where the, um, the artwork has a lot of colors. But also it's just the rest is just white. And, you know, there, it's not too much. Yeah, it's not too much. Yeah. No, I, I agree because, yeah, I don't like bold, bright shit really. But I also, they had had a pair, they had uh, Realtree camo skis years ago. That was my favorite ski. They were white on the top and orange on the bottom. I literally had them pull the same color orange for mm. these skis. Yeah. Because I, I remember getting like, there were like some street shots I got at night. And I was like, those bases just popped and looked good on film. So I was like, that was part of it too. I was like, all right, I want to make the bases orange. Yeah, I was rewatching those segments and I was like, whoa, did he already have yeah, those they, skis back in the day? <laughs> yeah, they look almost the same. Yeah. I'm guessing with those pro models, you get some type of royalty out of it. Yeah. How helpful is that as, um, you know, someone who's putting out free content and as we all know, like the ski industry is not what it once was. Oh, it's definitely super helpful. Like, you know, like last year I was at least at the point where I'd like, I ha- I made enough that I didn't at least I didn't have to work through the winter and could just focus on the skiing, which was huge to be able to just go on trips and just fo- you know and just focus all my time into that. So you know, it's not like I'm making a bunch of money, but it's it's enough to get by for the season and stuff like that. One of the things too, we'll have like our budget for the movie that pretty much you know like the money I get from Jay is a separate thing just to me, and I have other money that comes in from sponsors just to me, but we'll pitch and send all these sponsors and get a whole budget for the movie that pays for all of our lodging, gas, everything. Mm-hmm. So pretty much the only thing through the winter that I have to pay for is just like, you know, my 
my food and rent in Denver. So that's dope. So it's not bad. Like last year was able to actually do all of it and actually like make some money off making the movie, like have everything covered and still come out with like a few thousand bucks. So not too bad, which was the first, that was the first time that actually happened like that was this past year, Mm -hmm. which was sick. Cause with the, with the free content, you guys have less avenues of getting that money. Cause thinking back of stepped, they were similar to you guys producing movies like you guys. And, um, having s- sponsor support, but they were also selling hundreds, if not thousands of DVDs, which you guys don't have. Right. And that's the thing you think it's like, you know, I would assume like if we sold it for like 10 bucks, you probably could sell it at least, I'd think at least 2000, I bet. From my experience, every time you ask people to get out their credit card, you lose so much people. Oh, you but do. You, but you guys have a lot of hype. So I, I'd be curious to see how much you could get. Right. Well, then that's what I'm saying. It's like, say you sell to 2000 people for 10 bucks. It's like, all right, that's 20 grand. Like, that's not bad. You know, like, which I think, which I think we would be able to do. It's like Bermuda has like, I don't know, 130,000 plays or something. You would think you could sell at least 2000 of them. And when you look at it like that, who knows, who knows, who knows, but also whatever. I think it's better to pitch to the sponsors, you know, Hey, you do this, we'll get your stuff put out and we're doing it for free. So give us money so we can do this and make it free. Mm Mm-hmm. It's really cool to see how you guys are basically the gibberish team. Mm-hmm. Basically, when you think of gibberish now, I think of you guys. Like for a long time, gibberish was Wallish and a lot of the older generation. And I don't know when the switch was, but it's really cool now to see that basically gibberish is really trusting you guys and you guys are basically the poster boys. Yeah, well, it's sick too. I feel like gibberish kind of had a, a lull in like just in those few years leading up to before we kind of got involved, it kind of had fate. It wasn't like what it was in like 2009. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is sick. I mean, they're, they're super thankful for us as we are for them. Like they were like, literally like, they were like, you guys doing like the skiing and all the stuff you're doing, like helped a lot. Like they started selling more and they've been doing good. Like they've been killing it. And, and also they've been great with us and they all are just like our good friends, which is sick. To close off the episode, what can we expect from Sam and the crew this year? We're making another full movie, so Powder and Street all together. Um, probably just the filming's probably just going to get better. We're gonna, you know, we'll upgrade our cameras and stuff like that. Um, I'm, I don't know. I tend to think I'm gonna kind of like chill out a little, just because I, I can't keep hitting my head and getting hurt and all that. But. Uh, easier said than done once you know it's it's hard to hold myself back but uh will we see powder sam i don't know i if they're nice enough to piggyback me on one of their sleds you know but i want to i definitely want to get some clips in there hitting some backcountry jumps would be sick it's always dope to see guys that we're used to seeing in the street doing some pow jumps or some stuff like that i i know i want to i want to like since we're going back to one whole movie it's like all right it's not just a street movie also, we want to get a park shoot, which we're trying to figure out, which would be sick. Seeing uh, stuff like your um, the park edit you guys made this year, I-, I want to see all you guys in a park shoot. Yeah, hopefully with COVID chilling out, hopefully we'll make it happen. Probably just be filming a lot too. Hope to get some new faces in there, but probably spend, put more effort into the filming and filming like B-roll stuff because that was one thing with editing like that we kind of were lacking on. It doesn't seem like it once it's all put together, but that mm-hmm. was like the hardest part of making it because I'm like, damn, I actually should have filmed more shit besides just the skiing, you know? That's always a challenge where you spend so much energy on getting the shot as a skier and as a filmer, like going there and shoveling and getting it that sometimes you tend to forget to get other stuff around. Yeah, and it's hard with me because because usually I'm the one kind of leading that stuff. And Calvin's good about it too, though. He's good with like shooting B-roll and stuff. But then when it comes to editing, I'm like going through my shit. I'm like, there's no B-roll shots of me. I got nothing. I'm like, what the fuck? You know, because I'm always the one filming everything else. But we all kind of realized it. So I think come next year, we'll put a little more effort and be a little more like pay more attention just to shooting stuff like that and just to the overall film besides just the skiing, you know. Well, thanks a lot for coming on, Sam. Yeah, dude, thanks for having me. Really cool talking skiing with you. Yeah, for sure. I hope we get to see another Sam segment and 
Yeah, we will. Just, just wear wear your helmet, and if it's if it's too big or gnarly, just just don't. Right. That, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. But we'll see, man. You know. Thanks for doing it. Sweet. Yeah. Thanks for having me. So this is it for episode 23. I hope you enjoyed it. It was really cool to talk with Sam, and always super interesting to have some insights into movie projects like Most Gutter. A big thanks goes out to Jay Skis for presenting this episode, and also a big thank you to Access Board Shop and Planks Clothing for sponsoring this episode. Peace. Thank you.